our next speaker is Doug, Rout Doug Routley from uh, Lady Smith, Duncan, and Cowichan. And he's been working with the Marie McQuaid family to help them get some treatment. And I want to say happy birthday, Marie. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out in support of something that uh, people are left all alone suffering with, it seems. So people face such a maze of, of challenges when they encounter this disease, but are met with uh, deaf ear. From, from our system and I, I think that I'm, a, I'm asked to stand here purely as a representative of people suffering with the disease, not as an expert, not as a critic in the related field, but just to communicate with you how frustrating it is as a, as a representative in a democratic system to be representing people with an obvious need that is going absolutely ignored by, by our system. It's so frustrating. I think that uh, people ask me, what is the most frustrating thing that you found about politics? This is my first term. And what's the, most, what's the most encouraging thing? Well, the most frustrating thing is when the levers of public policy and democracy get turned against people. And you see it so many times. And in this case, a gatekeeping role that government is playing that is keeping people out and away from the services they need. But then on the other hand, the most encouraging thing is that I get to see how people affected by a multitude of things, be it Lyme disease or a whole range of other, other tragedies or difficulties, it's out of that experience that we build societies and that we build the kind of pressure to change things, not just for ourselves and the people we're immediately related to, but all of us. We understand when we're impacted by something like this, the implications to the whole community and to every single person. And it's that that motivates people like yourselves. And that is the most encouraging thing about the political process to me is what we offer it as ordinary people when we unite our efforts and our strength to turn over something that deserves to be turned over and this deserves to be changed this is a gatekeeping role I don't know what interest is being protected whether it's tourism or whatever but with education and with acceptance we can see that it's easily treated immediately treatable but if not people will be faced with a legacy of tragedy and suffering and it is absolutely intolerable we cannot stand for it so I encourage you all to continue with this fight it is frustrating it's frustrating when Jay McQuay Mary's dad phones me upset as he is with her condition and I go into the minister's office I'm told yes we'll send a Lyme literate specialist but that doesn't happen uh, time and time again, the prejudice is the wall that, that Jay and others like him and his daughter run into. So we have to change that. David's committed as his, the self-appointed critic for Lyme disease, and I think we should all uh, commend him for that. And we'll all work together over these next few months to see if we can make a change to this policy. Take away that gatekeeping function, that gatekeeping role, and open that gate to services for people who deserve it, people who need it. So. If, it, if we go into a vet's office, we see the literature. We go into a doctor's office, it's denied. It's just ridiculous on the face of it. So keep it up. It's a fight that we can win, and you, I, I encourage you to use every, every strength you have, and we'll be there with you to change that policy, bring service to our citizens, and solve this problem. Thank you. Oh, okay, I have one more speaker for you. This is a Lyme disease sufferer from Vancouver, and her name is Shannon. She's going to come tell you a story. All right, Shannon. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Shannon Gertson, and I am a wife and a mother of three children, and I am battling Lyme disease. I became ill with Lyme disease in July of 2006. Despite having classic progression of the disease, starting with flu-like symptoms, which rapidly led to severe headaches, excruciating joint pain, fatigue, and cognitive dysfunction, it still took nine months, countless tests, numerous visits to many doctors and specialists before I was finally diagnosed. Because my infection had been left untreated for so long, it became evident that I needed IV treatment to give me my best chances at recovery. In Canada, IV antibiotics must be prescribed by an infectious disease doctor, and so I was referred to several infectious disease clinics. 
My referral to an infectious disease clinic in Vancouver was denied based solely on my negative blood test from our provincial lab, even though Health Canada states on their website that the diagnosis of Lyme disease must be based on clinical presentation of symptoms because the tests are unreliable. However, I did finally find an infectious disease doctor who reluctantly prescribed IV treatment for me. Many of my most debilitating symptoms resolved while on IV. So it was to our great dismay and against our wishes and my nurse's recommendations that my IV treatment was stopped after three months. The infectious disease doctor treating me also stated that he would not give me any follow-up treatment and he would no longer see me as his patient. Since my IV treatment stopped in mid-April, I have spent much of the past two weeks once again bedridden with agonizing bone and joint pain, fevers, crushing fatigue, dizzy spells, and blurred vision. As I find myself once again ping-ponging back and forth through the medical system, I am finding one of two things. There are those doctors that are not aware of Lyme disease and its existence in BC. Or they do know about it, but they are unwilling to give a fair and unbiased evaluation of my symptoms. And either way, I am refused treatment, and the longer I am off treatment, the more I begin to deteriorate. I now fear that all the ground I have gained in my fight will be lost. Here are some of the statements that doctors have made to me just in this past month alone. I do not know enough about Lyme disease to treat it. I am not willing to get involved in the controversy surrounding the treatment of this disease. And I have taken a lot of heat from my colleagues for treating you. My illness and subsequent battle with it has been an incredibly long ordeal for my whole family. In a lot of ways, we have gone beyond survival mode and just do our best to exist through the challenges of each day. At times, living with Lyme disease robs me of my ability to drive, walk, talk, read, and write. It has robbed my husband of his partner and he has been left exhausted and depleted as he struggles to care for me, for our home, and be both mother and father to our three kids. It has robbed me of my ability to actively and consistently participate in the lives of my children. This loss is a cavernous hole in my soul, and I grieve it deeply. One of my sons best expressed his grief when he said, I feel sad because I don't remember what it's like to have a normal mom anymore. Lyme disease is the nightmare that my family and I live with every day, and it has presented us with the biggest challenge of our lives. As a family, we firmly believe that in the face of life's greatest trials, we have a choice to make. We can either focus on what Lyme disease has taken away, or we can choose to look beyond all that has been lost and find what is to be gained. While it is an incredibly difficult and painful journey, I will not let it rob me of my dignity, my courage, and my hope. And it is for these reasons that I continue to persevere in the face of both medical and political odds. I have faith and hope that one day soon, both myself and the many who are infected will find doctors who will see us as persons living with Lyme and treat us as individuals and not as obscure statistics that are expected to neatly fit within the parameters of questionable treatment guidelines. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming once again. I really appreciate you coming out here on this glorious day. And um, to thank all the speakers, you did a great job. And my son. Good job, Ben. Ben.